They have to use it for own research and deal with it. I would sign up with this. Yeah. I would sign up. Yeah. So we will start in a minute. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And I apologize for, uh, for, for starting late. The reason is that it's a very unusual match list. Uh, the first one, which is also in person. So, um, yes, that's why you don't see uh, me from very close, which is probably better for all of us. But you will see, you will see uh, Nabil from close because, because, yeah, I want him to be recorded. So he was just logged out from his Zoom. And then, then uh, he's going to get back. And, Hmm? Do you want to replace this with this? That you need a comfortable, more comfortable. What that feels? Yeah. That's probably better. I think it's fine. It's fine. So, so yes. Um, and then, then this is this is uh, also an unusual, much, uh, an unusual, much makes it a sense that this is the last one of the academic year. So, so welcome again, it is. And thank you for coming and, and for those who for whom is, it is the first but please please come back uh, next year we will start uh, doing them in in the, in October I think we will, we will make a start for the new year and it will be also also very rich I think we learned a lot including today uh, that's why we are late uh, about how to how to do it and. Um, and I think we are really building up a, a lovely community here, which is always growing. So, so please, please come along and please also advertise it to to other people and and make make them come along. Now, you know, you know, I have different ways to recruit uh, excellent speakers, and I have never been disappointed in. In any of our speakers, uh, and and uh, today is is unusual as well because by now I know Nabil, but I didn't know him when when we recruited him, and this is because I also asked my colleagues uh, to to suggest people uh, who, whom they know they would be excellent, and and it was Kumai uh, who who told me that that we should invite Nabil. And uh, yeah, I didn't ask my colleagues because I don't trust them. I do trust them, and I particularly trust uh, Kumail, who who is a gem of, of our, our our community, not just online community. You, you may probably know him because he's one of the most uh, frequent uh, participants at, at, at the match list in the discussion. But but he is also here at, at um, in Exeter, and he. He did. Did you do uh, also your MA with us? If I did, but he did. He, he did his his PhD with us, and now he is our colleague. So so that's that's a great joy to to have him. And uh, the reason why I introduce him is not just to thank him for bringing us Nabil, but but also because I'd like to him to chair this 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 session. Um, so please come back, please come out, and I will sit here. Um, uh, thank you so much for um, uh, organizing this. And uh, this is the last month, this as uh, the words of Quran would say, So, this would be the best of the uh, one of the best of the majorities which we had. Um, and like, um, I would like to congratulate this one as well, like uh, a row of like successful uh, majlises which we all benefited. Uh, each and every majlis uh, with variety of topics around the globe with variety of speakers. So, uh, Nabil, thank you so much for coming. Just, just a second, sorry. Um, I wanted to tell and then I forget that it's a very open <laughs> uh, majlis. So, so if you have any suggestions for speakers whom you would like to hear, please write to me or uh, or any other, what would you like to hear more? And then I would be will we'll take that into consideration surely. And also if you, if there was anything we didn't do right, please tell us. Okay. Well, and, and the majalis are recorded and they are all available online. So if you have missed anyone, uh, the videos are available to catch up. I missed like a couple and I'm like, um, catching up. So I would highly recommend that. Um, let me thank you so much for coming all the way from uh, Miami. Uh, Nabil is a very uh, close friend, um, but to introduce him, uh, he's a specialist in the field of Islamic studies, 
Uh, his research explores uh, authoritarianism in the Middle East, debates on the caliphate and the development of Islamic thought. He's a senior research advisor for MIPSTER, an arts and culture collective curating, enabling and amplifying artists of marginalized background through illustration, film, and music. So, this one, if you were highly impressed by the video of like his uh, uh, class at the Batalia, that's like, you know, there you see the connection. Um, uh, Nabil Hussain is the recipient of the Fulbright Award and the University of Miami Fellowship in the Arts and Humanities. Um, excellent track record as far as his studies is concerned. His PhD is from Princeton. Um, MA in Arabic and Islam studies from Howard. Um, and uh, his uh, latest book is on opposing the Imam, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, in which he examines the history of early Muslims who were hostile to Islamic or Caliph or um, uh, Shiites first Imam, Imam Ali, Ali Salam, and his uh, descendants. Uh, he teaches a variety of courses, and those courses are very popular, as we get the impression uh, from, uh, from the reviews. Um, early Islamic history, which I would be very much uh, interested in, and Islam as well, because we work on these areas, uh, and a variety of like, different uh, topics. Uh, uh, Bilal works in Bukhari. Uh, Nabil has uh, written an excellent article uh, if I'm a studio Islamica? Yes, in studio. Yeah, uh, modern Muslim objections on Bukhari. So a lot of I things to catch up and like you know, discuss. Um, uh, so I reviewed the article. <laughs> you did? Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for the critical comment. Thank okay. you so much. So it was not the critical comment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, without uh, any further delay, I would uh, welcome Nabil to present on the topic which um, uh, is Deconstructing Memories of Ali in Sunni and Shi'i Islam. Just one more thing to add that though we record uh, the much less as you probably know by now that we don't record the question and answers. So that's only for those who manage to, to, to come. Well, the main reason is to keep, keep the discussion free. So Nabil is going to introduce himself okay and, and then then his crush then his his topic sure. and then then uh, i will switch off the recording and then we go to the to the questions and answers and discussions is that that's the, that's sure. the so i can say a little bit about myself yes please and yes then, yeah if you have any questions you're welcome to uh, oh yeah you can you can also i normally the questions for everything we, we keep okay, them for the end okay great yeah yeah, yeah. Well, uh, thank you all for having me. So should I unmute myself here and, uh, okay. or, or should we keep the same? I, I... Are you sharing? Are you sharing your screen? Uh, and not yet, yeah. once the present. We don't have an echo anymore. Uh, I think you have to turn off that speaker. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as it was noted, my name is Nabil Hussein, and I teach at the University of Miami. I was asked to say a little bit about myself before I begin my presentation. So I started in the, well, maybe I should go back to my undergraduate years. When I enrolled uh, at the university, <laughs> when I enrolled at the University of Virginia, I was interested, like uh, many other students, in trying to find a career related to, uh, you know, maybe engineering, business, some way to make money. And uh, what I found was that I enjoyed doing my homework for Arabic. I enjoyed doing my homework for Persian. I enjoyed doing my homework for my Islamic studies courses. And one advice that I received as a freshman was, you know, if you follow your passion, hopefully doors will open up for you. And I know that's not always true. There are people who go into the humanities and it's a tough world as you continue uh, down that line and go into graduate school and then try to look for work. 
but I was extremely lucky that uh, following my passion led uh, me to research and live in the Middle East. Uh, uh, so I received a Fulbright and I went to Syria where I lived for two and a half years as a researcher. And then uh, that led me also uh, to Yemen. I was interested in genealogy, my, even my own family's genealogy. I'm of East African descent. I'm Ethiopian and my family had uh, family trees that showed our kinship with uh, tribes in Arabia and in Yemen. So I became a genealogist for many years. And then uh, uh, once I was done with that, it was, okay, how do I make money? How do I continue sustaining myself? And I began teaching English as a second language while living abroad. There were many opportunities for that. And it got to a point where it was either I continue living as an expat or I take up my graduate studies. And so I landed a job in Qatar where I was teaching English as a second language. And I was happy there. It was very comfortable, but I had to make a choice on where to go. And I applied for graduate school uh, for my master's. Uh, I was rejected from everywhere except for Harvard, which my dad taught me, told me that I needed to apply to, even though I didn't want to go there. I didn't know any of the professors there. And so that's, that was my first lesson that it's a luck of the draw, you know, flip of a coin. You never know where, where life will take you and how graduate admissions work. Um, and then when I was there, uh, there was a, there was a language, a research uh, language requirement. So in addition to Arabic and Persian, I had to show competency in either German or French, and I made the mistake of choosing German, which was much more difficult than French, and uh, I ended up failing the competency exam so many times that the last time that I took it was the last time which I could take it to get my degree, and I got my degree, so I was very lucky uh, so for all of you in Islamic studies where you're facing these types of language requirements and difficulties, I've been there. Uh, and so uh, I, was, uh, I was very fortunate to then have this teaching position at the University of Miami. It was uh, just last year, uh, alhamdulillah, that I uh, received tenure. So, um, you know, I now have job security after many, many years. I come from a working class immigrant background where you know, I was the first uh, to, at least in my nuclear household, let's say you know, my mom and dad may have taken community college courses, but I was the first to get a college degree and then uh, go get, get the graduate degree and then find stability um, in a, you know, beyond a working class uh, job. You know, to, and so we're very, very thankful uh, at this time. So, I mean, I think with that, short introduction. I, I do want to get to some of this research. And uh, if you guys don't mind, I'll share my slides now. First, this, this short introduction, it, it's sad, it shows why we are doing that, because there is always so much to learn. Uh, and I think it's, it's, well, we have now uh, future, future, well, young academic uh, in, in the room. And, and, and to know that, yes, we, it, it, it's sometimes um, the ways how things happen as it happen is fully unpredictable. This is very... Um, it's not completely uh, just just luck. So if you know they do something, get part of it. Yeah. Have you managed to set it up? I I was kicked out of the again yeah. again. Uh, unable to establish a secure connection. Oh. Sorry. And in the worst case, what do we do? Right? Oh, so it's just recent here. Yeah. Yeah. 
then I'll share my slide yeah. again. Or if or yeah, okay. I guess I can yeah, this is the second time I'm back. Yeah, okay. I don't know whether you heard what happened that uh well, was kicked out of the room. <laughs> so so uh, so that we are too many in that room to to have Zoom at the same time or something like it. But so if you see Aaron and do it and share if uh, yeah slides from you. Oh, that reminds me of something. Uh, my the fellowship, but say before academia was was, and uh, I was in in Hungary about to go as a guide to to Italy and I went to an internet cafe and opened the opened my emails and then there was an email from Berkeley. They said, they said "Do you want this fellowship or not?" I had, to, uh, I had to have the, the guy running the, running the, the internet company you know, that we never met before. Uh, the, the point is that, that you know, technology, don't, don't rely on technology. If you don't get a reply, go after it because, because it may well be that you, you are given something and, and you never learned about it. It's, it's, so it was really accidental that I actually learned about this this fellowship, which was given to me. Okay. Are I you think, in? I think so. I'm, I mean, I'm using your computer. If I can get a thumbs up, perhaps from. Uh, so both should okay, perfect. Okay. okay. Great. Wonderful. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank you all for being here today and taking time out of your busy schedules to listen to me talk about theology and early writing of history in the Muslim community. And I'd also like to thank uh, the Center for the Study of Islam here at uh, Exeter University, as well as Ishtalan, Sarah Wood, and Kumail Rajani for generously organizing uh, this event and inviting me here. So how did we get here? Ali ibn Abi Talib, the fourth caliph in Islamic history, Uh, the man at the center of the portrait before you was the close kinsman of the prophet and uh, who married Muhammad's daughter, Fatima, and thus became the father of all of the prophet's grandchildren. He's revered for his wisdom, swordsmanship, piety. He almost needs no introduction among Muslims. He's revered as a saint, right? Just to ask, can you hear it? Not being bad. Uh, we checked in the chat and there was a perfect. Okay, great. Because the quality of some people was better, actually. And so for many, he is also the second holiest figure after the Prophet Muhammad, right? He's considered the first Imam in Shiism. He's assassinated in 660 of the Common Era after four turbulent years as Caleb. Now, what I call the ghettoizing of Ali in Muslim culture and academia, I consider it to be quite common. By this, I mean that his life and political career is only ever discussed in the context of Shiism. The same can be said about his famous son Hassan, depicted on your left, and his son Hussein, depicted on the right, the latter being famously killed in a large scale massacre that is commemorated in each year in Shi culture. There's an unspoken rule that these heroes of Shiism and the life they led after the Prophet's death is only to be discussed in Shi settings or in those settings that aim to implicitly or explicitly discredit Shi doctrines about these figures. So there is this tension in viewing these uh, figures as specific to Shiism, or at least their political lives as one is part of Shi history rather than, let's say, a collective uh, uh, Muslim history. So why write this book? This book aims to provide a context and a space to understand the tensions, the stories, and the evolution of understandings about these figures in non-Shi settings. Thus, I directed my attention primarily to Sunnism, uh, studying Sunni hadith considered canonical and others that were not. I also turned to the literature of another sect uh, prevalent in North Africa, the Ibabis, uh, and they're also prevalent in Oman, and an early influential and rationalist theological school known as the Multazina. I did this to understand the diverse ways in which the stories of Ali and his son Hussein have been told by Muslims outside of the context of Shi'ism. 
The impetus to write this book came from the discovery that this venerated Sunni caliph and Shi Imam, and here I'm speaking of Ali, was once publicly reviled, cursed, in, in fact, in Muslim societies. I hope to understand the processes that facilitated the rehabilitation of this person from a villain, something of a saint. Uh, what were the processes that occurred um, to rehabilitate his tarnished reputation? And so I aim to understand the claims of Ali. Uh, the claims of Ali's, I, I aim to understand the claims of Ali's antagonists and their grievances against them in particular, um, uh, the relative obscurity and or extinction of sects upholding such views require the examination of Muslim literature across a number of genres. I engage in the first detailed study of the claims and arguments of Muslims opposed to the caliphate of Ali, thus the title opposing the Imam. Lastly, I wanted to understand the ways in which the views of early antagonists Ali endure in Islamic theology and literature until today. And so what are some key uh, terms that I use? Uh, well, uh, there are many schools within the religion of Islam, each one consisting of revered scholars who define what is orthodoxy or correct belief in the sight of God. And today I, I, I'd like to consider uh, the maintainers of orthodoxy within Sunnism, the large doctrinal school in this world. Second, I want to speak of canonical hadith collections, and here I'm speaking of uh, the collection of uh, Qadi, or the authentic collection, the Jamak Muslim of Sahih, uh, which is revered uh, in the Sunni world, and Bukhari, of course, was an individual who was active 200 to 250 years after the Prophet's death. And at the other end of the spectrum, right, if we're not talking about those hadith that are considered canonical and authentic, you have a biographical and historical and historical literature. Uh, and so if you were a Sunni scholar desiring to define what is orthodoxy, let's say two to three centuries after the prophet, I should say properly three centuries after the prophet, and you found a text that disagreed with your sensibilities and it came from a non-canonical source, the choice was easy. You simply dismissed the credibility of that source, right? But since this is an investigation of Muslim literature across all of these genres, we, we see these tensions uh, that are at stake. Uh, when we see that there are these contradictory claims made about Ali in both canonical and non -can and non canonical sources, but what do you do when a canonical text like the collection of Bukhari says something that disagrees with uh, orthodoxy? Again, uh, in the uh, third century Hijri, and so I discuss those tensions uh, in the sixth chapter of my book. What is it that scholars do when they can't just simply reject the text? as uh, inauthentic. Uh, in this uh, study, I also want to stake territory for reverence for Ali and Sunni culture. Um, and this explains the phenomenon of hundreds of hadith praising him in Sunni literature and non-Shi theologians who painstakingly argued against their rivals on why Ali was a legitimate caliph, why his family was considered noble at, at, in a time period uh, in which perhaps their co-religionists did not believe this. And so when Mu'tazili and Sunni uh, scholars did this, I, rather than referring to them as Shi, the term that I use is pro-Ali, right? They were, they exemplified pro-Ali uh, pro or pro-Ali sentiment in a time period when their, you could say their peers in Sunni or Mu'tazili uh, community scoffed or doubted uh, what later became orthodoxy as, oh, th these are simply Shi positions to believe that he's this uh, spiritual, th that he's the saint, that he's a spiritual and political authority and so on. And so I'd argue while the earliest partisans of Ali may have had the identifier Shi, meaning they're, they are min Shiat Ali, they're from the party of Ali, it expanded uh, beyond this group to include Muslims who revered him while having political and theological allegiances elsewhere. Thus, uh, I would describe pro alid sentiment as a trans-sectarian phenomenon. It wasn't just part of Shiism, but it gradually became part of Sunnism as well over these first three centuries after the Prophet's death. And so in this book, I consider the contours of pro-Alid sentiment as well as anti-Alid sentiment. 
And to get a sense of that, I'd like to draw your attention to a couple of texts. At the very end of chapter 33, verse 33 of the Quran, the verse reads, Indeed, God desires to keep all impurities from you, O members of the house, and purify you of thorough purification. Ayat al or the verse of purity. And so it's related even in Sunni canonical sources that the Prophet took his daughter Fatima, Ali, and their two sons and prayed that God purify them. Uh, when this verse was revealed, and Muslims understood the Prophet's prayer to have been accepted and answered. The community also agrees that Ali is the only disciple and caliph of the Prophet to be raised in the home of the Prophet from infancy. So Ali has these unique characteristics that are agreed upon with the Sunni and uh, uh, Shi communities. And so on that subject, Ali is reported to have said, certainly you know my special status in the eyes of God's messenger and the close kinship that I share with him. When I was only a child, he took charge of me and brought me into his home. And you can see the quote uh, on the screen. When I was a baby, he would hold me to his chest and cradle me in his arms. When I slept, I did so in his bed and beside him, so close that I could smell his fragrance. To feed me, he would first chew the food and then offer it to me. As a child, never did he find me speaking a lie, nor any foolishness, nor any foolishness in my actions. And so here we see Ali reportedly discussing how he was the only person among the Prophet's disciples uh, to be raised in his home. He states that even as a child, he was obedient to the Prophet and followed the path of virtue. For Shinis, these statements reflect the infallibility of Ali, a doctrine upheld as orthodoxy within Shias. And so he continues, God sent a mighty angel to the Prophet in order to guide him both day and night along the path of fine morals and the perfection of character. During this time, I followed him like a young camel who follows the footprints of its, of its mother. Every day he would stand as a banner and symbol of righteousness and morality and command me to follow him. Every year he would retreat and seclude himself in the mountains and caves of Girak. There I would see him where no one else would see him. In those days, Islam did not exist in any house except in the house of God's prophet. He lived in this house with his wife Khadija, and after these two, I was the third. I saw the light of divine revelation and breathed in the center of the prophethood. Now, this text is taken from the Nahdul a famous compilation of statements uh, attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib, including also epistles uh, attributed to him are in that collection. It's put together by a well known Shi scholar. And so I would say the question of authenticity aside, there is a sense here that the intent of this long monologue that you just listened to is to convince the listener uh, that Ali is clearly the best person to follow, the best person to trust after the Prophet Muhammad, that no one else has a close relationship to him. Ali is saying that he has this uniquely intimate relationship with the Prophet. And so the implicit argument is that others can't claim to have a superior claim than him to the knowledge of the Prophet or in being closer to him. And hopefully that's that's clear from that model. And so it's true that the Prophet approved of Ali in ways that were unique. One indication of this is that the Prophet declined all other marriage proposals from prominent Muslims uh, who wanted to marry his daughter Fatima. And both he and Fatima held that only Ali would be a suitable spouse for her. It was believed that Fatima had a piety or spiritual stature that was peerless among women. And so her spouse was also to resemble her in this peerlessness in these pro Allen and in these she circles, right? These are the beliefs that they are circulating about Ali and Fatima. And you can see this in Hadith about their Fala and for their merits. I argue that it can be said uh, with confidence that the Prophet viewed Ali as his apprentice and trusted companion. It's for this reason that the Prophet says about Ali, he is of my essence and I am of his. Or in another report, Ali and myself are raised from the same light. You are my brother in this world and in the hereafter. You are unto me as Aaron was unto Moses. And so, so far, we've considered characteristics of Ali, general ones that are affirmed in Sunni canonical sources. And when we turn to non canonical hadith, statements that medieval Sunni scholars didn't affirm were authentic, I'd say we get into murkier waters. Uh, you could say the claims get more provocative. Historians note that the Prophet said of Ali, You are my heir vizier and successor after me. Now, that sounds pretty straightforward regarding whom the prophet favored as his successor. But there's a part of the statement that copyists of manuscripts couldn't agree on. In some places, the prophet says, fi ahli, and in, in another statement, what's uh, recorded in these manuscripts is fi ummati, right? 
The ramifications of either statement are, predict are predictably enormous, otherwise I would be bringing it up. Right? According to one manuscript, the prophet is simply noting that Ali will be the next chief of the family, namely the Hashman tribe to which they belong. In another, the statement is much wider in scope. The prophet is appointing him as his successor in the entire community. And since we have both versions, even in a single text, so I found a, a hadith collection of Suyubi where he is he has both versions of this text with the same Islam, with the same chain of transmission. So it seems to me that he's just throwing up his hands and says, look, this is how I found it in one source and this is how I found it in another. And so we're left asking, is this a she affirming text, a smoking gun that was then defanged of its bite? Or is this an innocuous text enhanced with the she accretion? The authors I study in my book, especially in chapters three and five, as Jared and Ibn Taymiyyah, are adamant in supporting the second theory. So in this case, they are sure the Prophet said, Fi ahli, that Ali is my successor only in my family, in my kin. But later she's amended the text, so it read Fi Ummati, so that Ali was his successor in the Muslim community. And again, for those who read the Arabic script, if you take away the dots, the rasam or the skeletal, uh, consonants are very similar. So you could see if it's blotted over time, uh, why there would be a difference of opinion on this. Yeah, but may I ask just a bit of question on the generation? Yes. Does it mean they push in certain category? Does he accept it but he finds uh, or picks one or the other? So Ibn Taymiyyah doesn't necessarily talk about this one. If he does, he, uh, this would be, um, you know, the hadith uh, uh, in which the Prophet uh, is responding to, uh, uh, you know, call your close uh, kin, uh, 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 and so like you have it in and you have it in non-canonical sources, so it's easy for Ibn Taymiyyah to just reject this, but there are Muqtazilis who took this seriously, and they'll say, okay, Al-Waqdi has this, it's an early Sierra literature, so we'll take it seriously, and they'll say that, um, the specific text that they're that the Shi'is claim that he says uh, we'll see uh, and, and and so on. We don't find that in the versions that we have. It's only these are additions that uh, Shi'is have added. If Ibn Taymiyyah talks about that incident in Mecca, I'd have to go back and look at the appendix and exactly see what he says. But because it's not an economical source, it's easy for him to just reject it. Yeah. Um, but what he does with, let's say, Hadith <clears throat> al-Manzila, that you are on to me as Aaron was on to Moses, which is considered canonical, um, I, would I argue both he, Jahan, and Ibn Taymiyyah uh, blunt the polemical edge of any pro-Alid Hadith that they find, which suggests that Ali should be the caliph. And so they'll either argue that, uh, that the text is all, you know, had a kid. So this is what Ibn Taymiyyah says many, many times, that this is false, that this is a fabrication. Um, but with some of these canonical reports, he will claim that there are additions to it that are that are false, that are, um, and that she's have added these embellishments, or that they've been read out of their original context. So for him, it would be easy to say that uh, the context is fiat, the prophet's talking to his tribe, that, uh, that he's simply saying that when he dies, Ali will be the next chief of the Hashman tribe. All right, so after the prophet's death, the question of who would succeed him fragmented his disciples into a number of factions. The allegiances grew in their complexities as the decades passed. Here I'll try to start with simplicity and then gradually add to this knowledge base to help us frame these disagreements. First, there are those who supported authority going to the most senior members of the community who had the most clout. This faction became partisans of the first three caliphs. Not only did they revere the memory of these three and view them as pious authorities, but also they based Islamic law and knowledge of religion on the followers of these three caliphs. The second faction consisted of those who believed Ali was the natural heir to the Prophet. The clan to which the Prophet and Ali belonged was that of Hashem. Hashem and Kinsman and their partisans held Ali as the most knowledgeable and distinguished of the Prophet's disciples and revered them at times when other Muslims did not. The third faction to consider is represented by the clan of Ali's predecessor, Uthman, and uh, his family, the Umayyads. Ali's predecessor was assassinated after a siege of his home that lasted many weeks, if not months, and the family of Uthman blamed Ali for these events since those who had laid siege to the caliph's home had respected Ali. Although Ali may not have been involved in the assassination, the Umayyads considered anyone who had criticized Uthman 
culpable in this hyper-partisan atmosphere that really, if you're not with us, you're against us, and fomented tribal feuds. That's when Ali became Uthman's successor as the fourth caliph. The Umayyads immediately revolted against him. Many refused to pledge allegiance to him altogether. And to Ali's dismay, the partisans of the first three caliphs as well rebelled against him, and thus his caliphate was rocked with the civil war after civil war. And so to take a bird's eye view of how it all panned out after Ali's uh, assassination, the Umayyads take the reins of the caliphate and turn it into a monarchy, as we all know. They rule for close to a century. And then you have uh, the Hashemites who rule. Uh, it's the Abbasid wing after uh, the Umayyads are toppled. Uh, the Hashemites ruled for close to five centuries until the Mongols lay siege to the empire. Now, if we wanted to be, uh, if we wanted to take snapshots of allegiances to different religious and political authorities uh, 100 years after the Prophet's death, it would look something like this. You'd have four factions, one of them split two. You'd have those who revere the first three caliphs, those who revere the Umayyad dynasty, those who follow a Khadiji school, which is independent of Sunnism and Shiism. Uh, eventually, it's members of this Khadiji school that revolt uh, from Ali's army, and they believe he's gone astray, and they assassinate him. And they develop doctrines that criticize both Ali and the Umayyads and his rivals. Uh, and lastly, you have this pro-Ali faction split between those who say all authority should go to Ali's family and those who revered Ali and his descendants, but were more broad in viewing other members of the community as authorities as well. For example, they may have viewed the first two caliphs as wise and pious leaders, but also respected Ali. This was a sentiment that we can see among Kufans. So perhaps you could say Abu Hanifa and his uh, cohort, or even his teachers believed this. They would take Ali as a caliph and as a jurist. They relied on his opinions while also respecting Abu Bakr and Omar. Um, uh, but uh, with this faction, they did not view reverence for these different caliphs as necessarily contradictory. Now, if we take a snapshot 200 years after the Prophet's death, these different circles would still be intact with the caveat that there is now a religious elite. Scholars of the law and theology who've become fed up with caliphs claiming to be the successors of the Prophet, and they are the drivers of a new ethic. Uh, that the scholars, the ulama, rather than the khulafa, are the Walafat al Anbiya, are the real heirs of the Prophet. So while you have scholars that identify with the both actions, there's a, there's a set of centric scholars who keep an ethic of either we cannot judge because we don't have enough certainty on who was right and who was wrong in these civil wars, or we'll leave it to God to decide who to punish and who to reward in the hereafter, or you have those who say, who I would say take a more radical position. They're more radical in their optimism. They say we might have our own theories on who was right and who was wrong, but we'll maintain a belief that God will forgive everyone involved. And I would say that that final position became the orthodox position in Sunnism, Adal al Sahaba, or what is um, known as the righteousness of companions, uh, began to gain steam at the end of the second century AG, uh, and it became orthodoxy by the third century AG. So in the 300, 250 to 300 years of the Prophet, after the Prophet's death, you had uh, Hadith scholars, Hadith specialists who, who maintained that ethic. So one last snapshot. Uh, up there I say locating symptoms, and that's the title for those who are here. A little bit of the Zoom is uh, uh, affecting visibility. But our last snapshot is taken 300 years after the Prophet. While I don't want to diminish the existence of other factions and schools both within and outside of Sunnism and Shiism, in terms of the enduring culture surrounding Ali, I describe Muslims as having one of six different views. The first group is uh, uh, the first group is made up of zealous pro three caliphs, pro Umayyad, or Khadiji Muslims, publicly condemn Ali and his partisans as evil. Actually, sorry, um, let me talk about this slide. I was talking about a, a subsequent slide. If you wanted to locate Sunnism, excuse me, it's part of this burgeoning community of centrist scholars who acknowledge that their own teachers and authorities were part of one of these factions. They were, you know, they would say that their teachers may have been pro made pro three caliph or pro hashemite right? Uh, even if centrists themselves were not. 
Thus, to read a Sunni hadith collection is to read a work with contributions from those who are pro three caliph, pro Umayyad, and pro Ali and centrist. By contrast, I'd say it's fairly easy to read Shi'i works and understand their sources. They're mostly written by partisans of the family of Ali, who viewed them as rightful imams or leaders of the community, both in terms of political power and religion. Now let's take a snapshot of partisanship 300 years after the Prophet. The first group I'd say in terms of their views regarding Ali is that they are made up, that it's made up of zealous pro three caliph, pro Umayyad or Khadiji Muslims who publicly condemn Ali and his partisans as equal. The second group doesn't condemn Ali outright, but opposes any special veneration of him. They tend to say, well, he was a fallible person who may have committed blunders and that he may have harmed the Muslim community when he became caliph. Or in fact, some even deny uh, that he became a legitimate caliph altogether. And so you have, for example, uh, well, I'll talk about them uh, in a bit, but you had people in Andalus or Andalusia who believed that the four caliphs were Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and then Muawi, right? So Ali is written out in history altogether. So it's not that as Sunnis that they would have cursed Ali, it's just that they never believed that he became a legitimate caliph. The third group became the orthodox position of Sunnism. Ali is accepted as the fourth rightly guided caliph. The fourth group regarded him as the greatest Muslim after the Prophet, but didn't consider him divinely appointed. They held that Ali was the wisest and most meritorious Muslim after the Prophet, a doctrine known as Tawfiq Ali, but did not go so far as to say that Muhammad appointed him as his successor. The fifth group became the orthodox position of Shiism. Ali was the rightful heir of the Prophet, selected by God and the Prophet before Muhammad's death. And the sixth group was made up of radical Shi'is that viewed Ali as a manifestation of God the so-called Qulat. And in late antiquity, the belief in humans either being divine or demigods was quite common uh, place. It seems most cultures believe that about their rulers, pride myths of this type regarding holy men. It seems foreign to us now, but for the exception of Christianity, where God or the word is made flesh, Jesus. Uh, in this circle, stories about Ali's miraculous power over the universe, his omniscience and omnipotence were a common motif. The absolute monotheism that usually is associated with Islam made group six extremely marginal and condemned by both Sunni and Shi orthodoxies. Again, this is the so-called Qulat. So if the spectrum could be laid out from one through six for those who held animosity for Ali all the way down to those who believed in his divinity, it would look something like this slide. Now, all of this might seem a bit rudimentary, but I promise you the reason why I'm discussing this is that no one else has mapped out these nuances or this spectrum. The go-to model is anachronistic and tends to imagine Sunnism and Shiism as two branches that split apart after the Prophet's death. While the argument may require some charitable readings, my argument would be this. Sunnism is so wide in its scope that its literature preserves members who seem to occupy all six groups. If I was asked, I could place a Sunni scholar in each group, Shiism, by contrast, would only occupy groups four through six on the spectrum. Again, group one held animosity for Ali. Group two avoided his praise and veneration. Group three accepted him as a rightly guided caliph. Group four held him to be superior to all other disciples of Muhammad. Group five held that God and the Prophet had anointed him as his rightful heir, as Muhammad's rightful heir. And group six upheld his divinity. So if we were to zoom out to 300 years after the prophet's death, it's here that we can be certain people self-identify as Sunni or Shi'i. We can also discuss some of the cultural currents associated with the lay person belonging to each faction. And so what do we find? Shi'is can be accurately described as centering Ali and the prophet's family at the core of their religious culture. They have separate circles of learning, books and rituals that Sunnis do not. For pro-Ali Sunnis, by this point, they've come to revere Ali in very similar ways. Uh, he's a hero who's remembered as unparalleled in his wisdom in combat. And the Prophet's descendants are also revered in Sunni societies and mobility. And then we have those Sunnis who are skeptical of all of this reverence for Ali and the authenticity of Hadith that praise him. They tend to show sympathy for the Umayyads and scholars who are anti shi Thus, when they discuss history, it's one that aims to discredit pro Ali arguments, texts. And then there are those Sunnis who are 
mostly neutral on history, either in being uninformed or consciously not wanting to wade into controversial waters. Some Sunni laypersons remained aloof. The cultural code here is, I don't want to say something accidentally about a sacred figure in the past that will offend God, who will then punish me in the hereafter. And as a consequence, neither discuss nor take a position on this political history. Once we're close to 300 and 400 years after the prophet, it's worthy of note that there are geographic trends within Sunnism to lean toward Hutu, right? To reject Ali's reverence is well known in regions along the Mediterranean. Just as a network of scholars transmitted and diffused legal doctrines from Medina all along North Africa to the Iberian Peninsula, they transmitted Hutu doctrines about Ali. The claims of pro-Alits and Shis that venerated Ali is that a scholar associated with the Legal school of Madik ibn Anas, for example, the leading expert of law in Medina in the second century Hijri or eighth century of the Common Era, that this scholar in his circle also transmitted pro three caliphs or Uthmani doctrines that excluded Ali from veneration. And this was the doctrine that had been prevalent in Medina and associated with Madik before the prolifer proliferation of uh, another doctrine which became orthodoxy uh, in the subsequent century. And that was what I mentioned before, Adalat al or the Righteousness of all humanity. So, pro three caliph doctrines are attributed to large Muslim populations in the Levant. So, uh, in Sham, it was known as an Uthmani, a stronghold, uh, as you know, specifically cities of Damascus uh, and Jerusalem and Hadab. Um, uh, and then there's also Egypt, uh, or Misr, was also described as having Uthmani strongholds as well. When we move to North Africa, the attitudes even become more hostile because not only do we have scholars that are part of this Uthmani camp, but we also have those who are representative who represent the Khadiji tradition as well, uh, or the Ibadi tradition, which evolved from the Khadiji one. And these were individuals who one could label as group one. It was a Khadiji assassin that killed Ali, and it's in Ibadi manuscripts from North Africa uh, or modern day Algeria that we find something we find nowhere else in Islamic literature. Muslims condemning the prophet's grandsons, Hassan and Hussein, uh, almost uh, universally revered elsewhere, are condemned as misguided for their association with Ali's political career and their support of him. And it's in Ibadi literature that we also find in a few cases, this is not the norm, but in a few cases where Muslims praise Abdul Rahman ibn Munjab, the assassin of Ali, as someone who righteously rid the world of a tyrant uh, and would be rewarded by God. Although I should note to be fair, again, Ibadis as a school were ambivalent about Ibn Mujah. He was neither condemned nor praised uh, by many scholars. And I argue that that's because that there was an ambig ambiguity regarding Ibn Mujah. They weren't sure if he was a righteous Ibadi or did he represent one of the extremist radical Khadiji groups that they also viewed as rivals and whom they disassociated from. But finally, as I mentioned, there are those of the Iberian uh, Peninsula who believed the legitimate rulers of the Muslim world were Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and then the fourth caliph was Muawiyah. Uh, Ali is completely uh, erased in their uh, history. Uh, the, those Muslims who held Muawiyah to be Islam's fourth caliph were pro Umayyads, and they existed all the way in Spain because an Umayyad dynasty had been established there um, uh, after the Umayyad uh, dynasty had been toppled in, in the Levant, in, in, in the Sham. Now, if we study Shi literature across multiple genres, they would all converge on the following historical assumptions. First, that Ali never made a mistake in his life. God selected the prophet's family to serve as the heirs of the spiritual, legislative, and executive authority. Uh, the Alid Imams were omniscient and performed miracles as proof of their rank in the sight of God. And those who were not pro Alid were disobedient to God or considered evil. You would find reports from the disciples of the Alid Imams that claim these things. You can find that um, well, when we study what would be called hagiography or reports about sacred figures uh, that seek to exalt them. You have anecdotes that affirm all of these assumptions. Uh, theologians who would rationalize why these statements were true and so on. By contrast, when you read Sunni literature on this history, you get another set of facts. Right? We may be convinced that the Prophet desired Abu Bakr to, su to succeed him. Ali never challenged the authority of the first three caliphs. There was no disagreement between the Prophet's family and his companions after his death. 
the armies who fought Ali led these uh, insurgencies in pursuit of justice. And in fact, if you could point to uh, the leader of all of this civil unrest after uh, the death of Uthman, or during the Caliphate of Uthman and after him, it could all be pinned on an outsider, this shadowy, scheming uh, Jewish man who's everywhere and nowhere at once. And so he foments the murder of Ali's predecessor, he causes the civil wars, and you know, you know, not to be outdone by this anti-Semitic uh, trope, but his mother is also considered black as well, right? And so this careful study of this legendary figure known as Ibn Seba um, has been carried out by other scholars. Uh, Professor Sean Anthony uh, completed a dissertation and published a book on the subject, and I can discuss this figure more in uh, the Q&A. But what are the takeaways in studying these competing historiographies, or these, you could say, these competing uh, origin myths about where Sunnism and Shiism came from, or how the community engaged or fell into these civil wars? My takeaway in reading these competing sacred histories is that writers are engaged in a project of community building. They are producing collective identities through historical narratives that validate them. These tales that you read about Ali or about these other caliphs explain why I am X and not Y, right? When you read a story of Ali behaving as a wise, impeccable leader, uh, compassionate with the poor, and so on, it's an explanation of why I'm a follower of Ali 200 years after the fact, right? When you read a story of how the Prophet implicitly encouraged Abu Bakr to lead the community in worship, it's a compelling argument in illustrative form of why I'm a follower of Abu Bakr 200 years after the fact. These sacred stories, these sacred histories represent theology or ideology in narrative form, right? The argument I'm making here following, uh, the argument that I'm making here following Bruce Lincoln is that I would not need to read a catechism or a work explicitly laying out Sunni and Shi'i creed to know the orthodoxy of the school. One can see them on display in the arguments and assumptions of the stories we read in their sacred works of, of Hadith and their respective historiographies. The exciting aspect of early Sunni literature is that it is a trove in terms of diversity. A single Sunni work on history will have contributions from anti-Alids, from pro-Alids, from centrists, you know, people in the middle, and so on. Officially, Sunnism endorsed the views of group three, those who said Ali was the fourth caliph, right? And Ali was ranked as the, but on the other hand, we know that Ali was considered, uh, was ranked as uh, the best Muslim after the prophet, according to some Sunnis as well. The argument that I make is even though Sunnism came to uh, consider Ali as the greatest companion after the first three caliphs, when Sunnis engaged in anti shi polemics, they relied on those Muslims who espoused opposition to any special veneration of Ali, what I consider group two. And from time to time, it sympathized with the arguments made by Ali's antagonists, what I consider group one. This allowed anti alids of the first two centuries or the Mawasif of the first two centuries to continue to have an enduring legacy long after their disappearance and their explicitly anti alid doctrines had lost favor. I'd argue uh, Sunnis likewise included the contributions of early Quraylids in their literature, and this led some of them to regard Ali as the greatest Muslim under the Prophet, or what I can call a group four, while others resembled Shis even more, identifying him as a right own spiritual heir of the Prophet, right? So you have Sunnis that say he is the Wasi, he is the Mola, the Mu'minin after the Prophet. They're saying this is in terms of spiritual authority, right? That, God had designated him as such. And so you see pro Alid Sufi word um, that uh, proliferate uh, after, you know, let's say five to six centuries after the Prophet's death, where many of these Sufi orders identify Ali as the spiritual heir of the Prophet, although they refrain from criticizing the first three caliphs or uh, criticizing their or rejecting their legitimacy when they did this. So it's in this study that we can see how uh, efforts to shape the portrayals of Ali among Sunni scholars who view themselves as representatives of orthodoxy could, could be seen multiple ways. First, they sought to suppress and condemn overt anti-Ali sentiment or not in Sunni literature that was transmitted. It became heresy to curse Ali or accuse him of sinfulness. 
Second, scholars aimed to discredit any whiff of Shiism. They included text for this included text portraying Ali as superior to his predecessors or noting any disagreements he had with them. And third, scholars circulated reports in which Ali appeared as a fallible person. This organically happened whenever they drew on the legacy or contributions of pro free caliph in May predecessors, as the research demonstrates. And it's also in the final chapter of my book that I go deep in the weeds and I consider the techniques and tools that Sunni Hadith scholars used to forge an image of Ali that suited orthodoxy. I can share with you just two or three if you like uh, right now. First, there's the flat out rejection of anti Ali Hadith, right? And the easiest way one did this was through ad hominem attacks or criticisms of the transmitters. And so you have an example of this Ibrahim ibn Yaqub al Jazajani narrated that he heard. Numea Prince explained that the Prophet described Ali as the Qarun rather than the Harun of the community. That Ali was the biblical Korah rather than the biblical Aaron of the Muslim community. And so while this person narrates Hadith in the collection of Bukhari, this specific report is rejected. Right? But this is still someone who is considered a reliable transmitter. Um, uh, Ibrahim ibn Yaqub and Jazajan. Second was deflection. In some cases, the hadith or historical report in question could not be fully rejected because it referred to an incident that most people believe to be true. And so in the Prophet's lifetime, the example of this is that a wife of the Prophet is falsely accused of infidelity. This distresses the Prophet and the wife in question, and this causes a public scandal. Now, according to the Umayyad princes, and again, we have this report in the collection of Bukhari, um, Umayyad princes narrated this entire tale with Ali as the culprit, Ali as the uh, one who spread uh, this slander uh, against the wife of the prophet. Now, what, what do we mean by deflection? When Hadith scholars narrated this tale after the Umayyads had gone or after they were humbled, we see that there are reports in which other unnamed hypocrites are responsible for spreading the slander. That there's a time period in which that person is named, and that person is Ali, according to, let's say, uh, the Umayyad family. And we have evidence uh, of this. The third tool is simple deletion. I argue that copyists and compilers of Hadith collections were occasionally compelled to delete components of a report that they found offensive. For example, both Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi and Ibn Abi Hadith transmit a hadith on the authority of Bukhari that state the family of Abu Badr are no allies of mine. In the Ali Abu Badr, they should be awliya'i. By the Mamluk period, extant copies of Bukhari Sahih no longer identified the family of Abu Badr as the companion question. Of course, you guys know Abu Badr is the father of Ali, so it's talking about the family of Ali. And so in his assessment of the report, the famous Sunni Hadith scholar commenta and, and commentator of, of Bukhari, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, concurred that Abu Talib's family was indeed originally named in the report, although copies of the Sahih no longer did so. Ibn Hajar was sure of this because he found a variant of the report that had not deleted the family's name. He and another commentator noted in their respective works that some copyists mistook the note about the deletion or blank space, the layout, in the manuscript for the name of a tribe. Thus, these copies understood the Prophet to have declared the family of Abu Bayyad, or the family of Abu Blank Space, are no allies of mine. It seems that Bukhari's report essentially appeared in four different forms uh, in its transmission. Then. Uh, there's the uncensored version, right? The obfuscated version, where sometimes you see it stated that the family of Abu Fudan or Abu so and so are no allies of mine. Then there's the erased version. Right, where there's a simple uh, blank space, and then those who mistakenly corrected the hadith, right? So the mistakenly corrected edition that says the family of Abu Bayyad are, yeah, are no allies of mine. And so, of course, this idea of amending a text so the name isn't there, rather it's just Fulan is something that we see elsewhere. Again, the example I'll give you is uh, from the Caliphate of Omar, where you have a companion named Samura and Junda who's selling intoxicants. And so Omar says, may God curse Samura. When you when you look in Bukhari, it says, may God curse Quran, may God curse so-and-so. But the exact same report appears in the Muslim of Ahmed ibn Hanbal, and we have the name. We know who that person was. So we see the amending going on, uh, this obfuscation of the companion's identity. Likewise, uh, the obfuscation of objectional material. We see that uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib is 
uh, in a report that it appears both in Bukhari and in Muslim and Abdullah, uh, the Muslim of Abu Basar, Muslim Ahmed al Hanbal, a widely reported hadith in which Omar is quoting Ali and Ibn Abbas or Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet, as uh, being critical of Abu Bakr and himself for their views or their rulings in regards to the estates of the Prophet, the, the land of Fadr, and so on. He says, you claim that Abu Bakr was this and that, or in Bukhari says, kada wa kada. you used to say this about, about Abu Bakr, but when you look at Sahih Muslim, Muslim uh, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, Muslim of Abdul Razak, the, that part of the material that's considered objectionable is not obfuscated, right? So what are we learning from all of these examples? We see how a single canonical work, a text understood to be unimpeachable in its historicity among the faithful, pres preserves evolving and contradictory images of the sacred figure. In some cases, a claim was so offensive, not only was it suppressed, but memory that such a claim once circulated was erased and denied. As a consequence, we see that made hadith and doctrines are mostly excluded from hadith collections, but at the same time, when we read the work of Sunni Polemicists, there is a second move to deny that the Umayyads or early companions ever really hated Ali. Rather, they all respected one another in the ways that Sunni Muslims respect them today. Thus, anti-Ali sentiment has come to possess an erased history, borrowing a term from Monday Brown. It's not that it no longer exists, that there's, there's a denial that it ever existed. Okay. I've seen Hellenists now argue that the Umayyads never cursed Ali from the pulpits, which is a very difficult claim since the evidence that we have um, is that they did this for many decades across multiple cities. In the examples that I've shown you, we see the editorial enterprise at work in the maintenance of orthodoxy, and we understand the tools that scholars use to shape images of Ali that agree with their sensibilities as time pass. So let me close uh, by stating that partisanship and the polarization of society outlasted the lifetimes of these seventh century figures, right? these rulers of Arabia. Muslim literature preserves the sentiments of all of these factions in both canonical and non-canonical literature. A study of the formation of Sunni orthodoxy regarding Ali is a study of all of these different sentiments that we've talked about. Lastly, I'd argue that you know, coming from the United States that polarization in American politics today is reminiscent of these seventh century Hashemid and made rivalries for the throne and the historiography that ensued. You know, President Obama is viewed as a good person and a righteous leader by many, but he's reviled as an evil and illegitimate ruler by a rival tribe. 200 years from now, there will be partisans of Obama and many historians who will praise him, but also a threat of antagonists relying on conservative media or even foreign journalists who are acutely aware of uh, President Obama's uh, foreign policy and you know, drone warfare. Um, and will we'll characterize him as someone who did not have praiseworthy policies. The same goes for Donald Trump, who's a polarizing figure with the of followers. As we speak, we're competing, we're, we are creating competing historiographies and leaving them for posterity. And so as the decades pass, let us not be surprised with the spectrum that unfolds as it did in Islamic history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Navin, for a uh, brilliant talk. Uh, I know uh, uh, others might would express the same sentiments of uh, the enjoyment. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, now we have time for question answers. Um, so I would keep. the recording now and it's it's the question and answers and thank you happy this was fantastic thank you sir thank you